Greetings, brothers and sisters. Jojo Magoo did something, or his administration and his handlers are doing something that's just so greasy that we've seen before. I mean, just absolutely despicable. Scraping the bottom of the barrel with what we just saw displayed here. And I'm going to get into his speech. I hadn't heard his speech, but I saw a couple of parts of it, and I saw the way the media was covering it and covering up for him and backing him. And it's just despicable. Absolutely bottom of the barrel manipulation. So um, I want to, I got two other small short things to get to before I talk about that. But there's, um, I just want to preface this with a little bit of an introduction here. And you can see MSNBC, this is the front page. Biden vows to retaliate against terrorists who killed U.S. Army members in Afghanistan. Taliban leader reaches out to West, promises rights for women. ISIS-K didn't aim to attack just Americans. It also wanted to embarrass the Taliban. So there are some principles of deception here, okay, that you've seen, you know, I mean, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't, but you'll be able to see it when you watch the video. But there are a couple of principles here that I'm going to come back to. Number one is... They introduce a new character, a new villain, and almost immediately that villain does something bad. So we'll, we'll, I'll show you that. I'll show you how they, you know, work that into the narrative. The other thing is with America, allies are always becoming enemies and enemies are always becoming allies. They just switch it up all the time. You know, these people that used to be enemies become allies and people who used to be you know, American assets, American allies become enemies. And so this happens constantly as well. But anyways, it's all right here what they're trying to do. You know, he's trying to salvage a win from this thing and look like a tough guy and a hero, and it's, you know, just despicable. So let me get into this first. Um, there's two things I want to cover here. The first one is Harvard University names a devout atheist as its new head chaplain who describes himself as a humanist rabbi. Ivy League school says it's catering to the 40% of students who are not religious or agnostic. Greg Epstein will become the head representative of the religious community at the Ivy League school. So if you're a religious member, it doesn't matter what your religion is. It's probably going to be Christian, but it could be any number of religions. Or you could be a spiritual person, a person who just believes in God. And you have a problem with the university and you want, you know, somebody on your side, you know, somebody who believes in God, right? Because you believe in God, you know, somebody who could understand what a person who believes in God is going through. You don't have that anymore at Harvard. You've got an atheist, right? And it says here, his elevation to this position is meant to be inclusive of a larger, of larger and larger numbers of Americans who identify as spiritual but not religious. Well, that's not, you know, he's an atheist. <laughs> you, know, you know, I say this all the time because of the heartfulness meditation that I do, that spirituality, and, you know, my belief system, spirituality, which is an internalized relationship with God, is better than being in a religion. You graduate from a religion. Religions aren't bad in the sense, you know, I mean, the religious organization is often bad, has um, anti-God sentiments, but religions disconnect people from God, and the religion acts like a middleman between you and God. You know, Swami Vivekananda, a famous Indian, uh, you know, Indian saint said that a religion is a great thing to be born into, but a horrible thing, to, a horrible thing to die in. At some point, you make the transition. Jesus did. Jesus was born in a religion, but he became a spiritual person and had a direct relationship with God. And so this is, you know, something I believe, and this person doesn't represent me, right? Because <laughs> he's an atheist. He's not somebody who's spiritual. He's an atheist. You know? <laughs> and so that's where we are in 2021 at Harvard. This is what they do at Harvard. And so before we get to Jojo Magoo, there was this thing, this last thing from Andrew Cuomo's. I saw a droopy dog, Jake Tapper. This is from like two days ago, and I didn't get a chance to put this in a video, but it's kind of important, and also to the context of the deception and deceivers. 
Topping our national lead, the state of New York is now clarifying today that nearly 12,000 additional people had been omitted from their state's official COVID death toll. Newly sworn in governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, promising today that, quote, transparency will be the hallmark of my administration. Yeah, I wish there was some sort of independent organization or, you know, organizations out there that would fact check claims. You know, the CDC had had um, the correct number, the number that New York is now adopting in terms of COVID deaths, which is they'll, they'll tell you how many that is. It's like 13,000, 12,000 more. And the media who was slathering all over Andrew Cuomo's accepted his lie right, for a long period of time, like six months. The revised death toll aligns with the numbers that the CDC has. The CDC had clashed until now with former Governor Cuomo's widely criticized calculations, which seem to undercount the number of COVID deaths in nursing homes. The way the media and social media is, has been working or it's been focused, that independent people, like they did this with Trump, who was president, aren't allowed to go against the authority, the authoritative news, the authoritative, um, you know, this, the authority in this case would be the CDC. That Andrew Cuomo, like if Trump was, was touting his own facts, right, alternative facts, he would be called on, people like me would be called on, right? You would see it on Facebook and other places. Andrew Cuomo was going against the CDC's statistics with his own statistics, and for a long time, he was able to get away with it, and he was treated like a hero. He was covering up COVID deaths from his horrible leadership, right? And now they're dropping this after he, you know, after he um, has exited his position. CNN's Bryn Gingras joins me live. And Bryn, just to remind our, our audience, why did this discrepancy omitting these nursing home deaths exist in the first place? Well, Jake, that's a question I think there's a lot of families who lost loved ones are still asking to this day and still wanting answers to. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But first, let me go through those numbers. The Hochul administration is releasing the state's COVID death total, like you said, Jake, consistent with death certificates submitted to the CDC. So that means anyone in New York, anywhere in the state who died of COVID or may have died of COVID are counted in this tally. Hochul said in an interview, there are presumed and confirmed deaths. People should know both. Now, up until his very last day in office, earlier this week, Cuomo's administration was releasing death totals from the state's internal system, which tracks the deaths of people who were confirmed COVID positive and died in a nursing home, hospital, or adult care facility. So that's how Hochul's administration is getting that extra 20 or 12,000 deaths. Of course, the undercounting, like you pointed out, is a criticism that plagued the Cuomo administration, which has been accused of reporting that conservative number of deaths in the state to keep that number low comparative to the rest of the country. And he was allowed to get away with this for a very long time. And, you know, these were the nursing home deaths. Well, we'll let them finish up here, but... The discrepancy in numbers also, of course, goes back to that March 25th, 2020 directive when Cuomo issued an order telling nursing homes they couldn't deny admission of COVID positive or presumed patients. He revised it weeks later, but the argument, of course, is it contributed to spreading the virus among the state's most vulnerable. And this is a new trigger, this number, as you can imagine, for many New Yorkers, Jake. Even today, as Cuomo is no longer in office and Hochul is promising transparency, in addition to that transparency, I'm told by at least one family they want accountability for what they see as a massive failure by the Cuomo administration, including the state health department, which, of course, is still under Hochul at this point. So even as Hochul is just a few days in office, this is an issue that she now inherits from the Cuomo administration. So we'll have to see how she answers those families' questions. But, of course, it is good to get those updated numbers. Finally, Jake. Now, there's lots of problems with this and how this ties into with Jojo Magoo and what I'm going to cover today is liars be lying, right? <laughs> that this is all about deception and who's allowed to get away with it. I mean, Cuomo's being called on it now, but for a long time, he was getting away with it in ways Trump wouldn't. For example, when you're given, you know, the media slants things in a way that's, um, they were making Cuomo a hero, giving him an Emmy, all these things. And he was lying about 
12,000 deaths. I thought it was 9,000, but now it comes out it's 12,000 deaths of people in nursing homes because he put sick people, people with COVID, in with the most vulnerable people, and that created, uh, you know, a large number of deaths here and probably a lot of other suffering that lawsuits are going to come from this. And so they waited until he was gone to make this official. And then what's happened now? A big event's happened. You know, we have the Afghanistan thing going on. And, <laughs> you know, who's, who's going to care about this right now, right? And all these things that are going on in New York, the anniversary coming up, all these other things. And so maybe there'll be lawsuits, but if they had kept Cuomo around or if they had fired him for this, which this is what he should have been fired for, and the media covered this, this could bankrupt New York. We're talking about 12,000 wrongful death suits because of his incompetence. And that's why he's gone. And that's how, you know, they do these things, right? They waited till he was gone. He dropped the information and then a big event happens and everybody moves on to something else. So with that in mind, let's go to Jojo Magoo. So this is Biden's speech from yesterday. Like I said, I haven't seen it. I've seen parts of it, and I've seen the parts that the media is featuring, and they were, the media, I mean, the, you know, pro-Biden, MSNBC, and um, CNN, and Huffington Post, that are pimping this guy, pumping him up, right, who are, you know, acting like his hype man, <laughs> and so um well let's let's get into it here this evening in kabul as you all know terrorists attacked that we've been talking about and worried about you mean yesterday you talked about this i'll show you that in a second i mean you just talked about it yesterday it isn't like we've been talking about it you've been talking about it right <laughs> that the intelligence community has assessed, uh, has undertaken <clears throat> an attack by a group known as ISIS-K. <clears throat> that was a tell. <laughs> so um, let's talk about this, this first part. So they've introduced a new character, and he's saying the intelligence community, which is the CIA, which has lied to the American people many times before, especially about war. And then the CIA comes out, like, so many years later. Like, for example, so this is from um, 2013. Declassified documents reveal role in 1953 Iranian coup. And so this was Operation Ajax, which most people already knew was, you know, they messed up Iran. They messed up Iran. Iran is the way it is today because of the CIA. They had this moderate democratic leader, the kind of politician they say they want now in Iran, right? Instead of having a uh, theocracy, had a you know brutal theocracy. I mean, the, the government of Iran, Iran's considered one of the axes of evil, but they had this guy who was very modern. The Iranians were moving into, you know, having business deals, and there was BP was developing the oil industry, British Petroleum, in Iran. And this guy came in like a capitalist and said, we don't want to give you 80-20 split where British Petroleum were getting 80% of the profits and Iran, the Iranian government was getting 20%. They said, let's split it 50-50. And BP started to cry and they went crying to the CIA for some reason, even though they're a British company. And the CIA said, we'll get rid of this guy. And they did. And so um, how the CIA overthrew Iran's democracy in four days. And they lied about this, right, for years. And they put in the Shah of Iran, who was a puppet, who turned out to be a brutal dictator. And the Iranians rebelled. And then what happened with the hostage crisis, very similar to what's going on in Afghanistan now. I know some people in Iran from, you know, the you know, meditation I do. And um, they just, they're miserable there. And America screwed it up, right? I know America screwed it up. Like, I'm an American, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, you know, they don't, like, you know, hold anything against me personally. But, you know, it makes me feel a little bit, I don't know, bad about it, right? And the CIA's been doing this stuff for years. And they lied to us about this for years. And then finally, 
60 years laughter, they admit to this. They admit how they screwed this place up. And so this is what the CIA does. And you can't say, all right, the CIA can be trusted. This was his speech from two days ago. The risk that I've been, I've been uh, briefed on and the need to factor those, re- those risks in, they're real. And sig- those risks are real. He's telling you, this guy, this truth teller, this believable guy is telling you the risks are real. The intelligence community has briefed him on him. Significant challenges that we also have to take into consideration. The longer we stay, starting with the acute and growing risk of an attack by a terrorist group known as ISIS-K. Who? Of an attack by a terrorist group known as ISIS-K. Who's that group? (laughs) So they've just introduced somebody new. We've never heard of them. We've never heard of this, right? Never heard of ISIS-K. And all of a sudden, these introduced this new character. This is what I was talking about in the beginning of the video. And literally a day later, they attack Americans. Biden says he's ordered a retaliatory strike against ISIS-K. All this stuff here, all these news. This from CNN. What to know about ISIS-K, the terror group claiming responsibility for the Kabul airport attack. U.S. President Joe Biden vows to hunt down and punish those responsible for the deadly Kabul attack. The Islamic State affiliate ISIS-K claiming that it is behind the suicide blast, which killed more than 13 U.S. servicemen. And so and then they had all these pundits immediately saying, or, you know, these various experts on the news that it was this group. So they introduced... The acute and growing risk of an attack by a terrorist group known as ISIS-K. They introduced this, and then literally, not even 24 hours later, they attack. And there's a big event. And then he's trying to capitalize on this. Let's just watch the end of this right here. An ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan, which is a sworn enemy of the Taliban as well. Every day we're on the ground is another day we know that ISIS-K is seeking to target the airport and attack both U.S. and allied forces and innocent civilians. Additionally, when the big event happened, you know, 20 years ago, and, you know, immediately back then, you know, because I was, I mean, I knew some things, but not, you know, what I, nearly what I know now about these things, right, pattern recognition, I immediately said, It was, you know, the group, right? The base, the group that we were told for years did everything like that. I'm like, oh, I bet they did it. I bet they did it because these guys trained us. This is what they're doing, right? So when you heard this yesterday, when the Americans heard this guy say this stuff, you know, I mean, let's just watch that again. He's basically giving you a clue to what's going to happen. He's foreshadowing something that's going to happen. Been uh, briefed on. And the need to factor those re- those risks in, they're real and significant challenges that we also have to take into consideration. The longer we stay, starting with the acute and growing risk of an attack by a terrorist group known as ISIS-K, an ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan, which is a sworn enemy of the Taliban as well. Every day we're on the ground is another day we know that ISIS-K is seeking to target the airport and attack both U.S and allied forces, and innocent civilians. And it happened. And so when it happened, your first thought, if you're trusting this guy, and you're trusting the media, and you're trusting the CIA, if you're a you know, good American, and you believe in the American America, you would say, hey, I bet that was ISIS-K. That's the way that they're framing this. Now, I can't prove I'm not in Afghanistan. I can't go there and figure out what happened, right? I'm not, you know, I don't have access to raw data and information, but I do have pattern recognition and I do recognize bullshit when I see it, when I hear it, right? When somebody, you know, like he actually said this and tells America this is going to happen. Every day we're there, this is a risk that's going to happen. And then it happens the very next day. And, you know, we've seen this before. They introduced a new character and I'll explain it more in just a bit. Let's go through this, see if there's any more here. Additionally, thus far, the Taliban have been taking uh, steps to work with us so we can get our people out. 
but it's a tenuous situation. And so he's he's defined the future enemy, which is ISIS K, and now he's talking about the Taliban being an ally because they're the sworn enemy of ISIS K, right? So this is the other piece I was talking about, where an, where an enemy becomes a friend. And I'll explain why it has to go this way in terms of the narrative to sell it to the American people. You've been talking about, I'm worried about, that the intelligence community has assessed, uh, has undertaken <clears throat> an attack by a group known as ISIS-K, <clears throat> took the lives of American service members, standing guard at the airport, and wounded several others seriously. He had also wounded a number of civilians, and civilians were killed as well. And so there's another piece to this. Um, I just want to, you know, I covered this yesterday from my remembering Patrick, Pat Tillman video yesterday. There was, um, you know, somebody either left a comment or sent me a message that this thing had just gone down. So I went to MSNBC to see what they were going to say about it, right? And I did a little, you know, um, when I was editing my video, I did a little, I added this in there. And this is what they said, which was very interesting. Others are hurt. The Taliban also went on to claim that Italian military personnel were deployed at the gate where the blast took place and that U.S. officials moved their people inside the airport, quote, a few minutes before the blast happened. Again, that. So this was the raw story that Americans weren't involved at all, that the Americans moved their personnel inside, Italians took over, and then there was a blast. But then it came out, the story changed, and 13 American soldiers had died in the blast which is interesting because the Taliban said, no, this is what happened. And this was the original story. And now the story has changed, which often happens here. The story changes. People on the ground report one thing, and then more information is given, and it contradicts the original story that was given by people. This is, in this case, the Taliban, who said American troops weren't even there. And so when you tell two different stories, right, that you know, when your stories don't match up or they change, that's another indication of a lack of, you know, why would we trust you? I mean, this is, you know, there's patterns of behavior here. I've been engaged all day in constant contact with the military commanders here in Washington, the Pentagon, as well as in Afghanistan and uh, Doha. And, uh, my commanders here in Washington in the field have been on this with great detail, and you've had a chance to speak to some so far. Now, he's um, trying to come across as somber here. He's trying to come across as caring and all these things, but he just has real low energy. Like, he has the get off my lawn, come on, man, you know, that part of his 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 spiel is... Uh, his shtick, but then he has um, this low energy Jojo Magoo. The situation on the ground is still evolving, and I'm constantly being updated. <clears throat> These American service members who gave their lives, it's an overused word, but it's totally appropriate here, were heroes. Heroes who have been engaged in a dangerous, selfless mission to save the lives of others. See, so he's linking himself to them, right? He's linking their, you know, this tragedy to them, and he's a part of that, right? He's a, you know, he's a commander in chief, and he's on their side. See, a wartime president in America, because we're a war country, we, you know, America is a very militaristic country with the military industrial complex and a long history of violence and war and football and all these things, right? And when you're in battle, you forget about differences. I and mean, we've seen this, the Democrats and the Republicans come together and rally behind a president when we're under attack. And this is how they've used this in the past 20 years ago. It's how we got into this mess in the first place. Americans blindly following their lying leaders who are deceiving them, Dick Cheney and them, and saying, go on there and, you know, do your thing, do what America do. 
And so he's trying to, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of patterns here that can be seen. We see it over and over again. You know, America always has an enemy. You guys remember, like, when I grew up, it was first the Russians. When I grew up as a little kid, Vietnam was ending. My brother was in Vietnam when I was two years old, and Vietnam was ending. And then it became, the, it was the Russians, even at Vietnam. The reason that we were in Vietnam in the first place was it was a battle against communism. Communism was the enemy. Russian communism. And so there are these wars against Russia that were fought in other countries that were anti-communist wars. Cuba was going communist and they were right at our, you know, right off Florida's coast. And there's all this stuff about communism. America always has to have, oh, look at this, these, you know, what's bad stuff. Look at this evil people that are trying to take away your stuff, your freedoms. They want to, you know, communism are trying to wreck, wreck America. And America is so, you know, superior militarily. Our army is so superior to oppositional forces. Our weapons are so uh, far more advanced than other countries that no country can stand against us. So it went from the Russians when they collapsed when I was in high school, and there was a switch, and then all of a sudden, you know, when you watched a B movie, uh, you know, one of these sort of guy movies, one of these... Um, spy movies or army movies or whatever it might be it was always the russians and communists that were the villains and then it went from them to islamic terrorists and all of a sudden you'd go see an arnold schwarzenegger movie and he was fighting islamic terrorists or you know and back to the future it was the libyans that were killing dr brown whatever you know, i've covered this in the past and then at some point it switched to domestic terrorists these were angry right-wing people like Cubies, which has been now for a while, right? They were the enemy. So it was an internal enemy. But America always has that, right? America always has these group of disgruntled people or countries or ideologies. There always has to be an enemy. You know, and there's always a, a derogatory sort of racial um, nickname that the troops use for the enemy, right? Whatever it is, based in, you know, the the people they're fighting. I just watched, um, uh, you know, my brother's been talking about Vietnam lately and I saw Platoon. You know, and I see movies on a totally different level now. Like that's how I can see how much I've changed. The movie Platoon is so bad. It's a horrible movie. It's like a, a poorly made movie. But this is, you know, the ideology that's there of America always having to have an enemy. I'll come back to that maybe in a future video. So I'm in the editing process of this video, and I don't think I said this as clearly as I could have, and I just want to restate this. So if you look at American wars and the use of television and movies, that especially, you know, in recent years, but this has happened over and over again, the intelligence community and the government comes out and says, there is a threat out there. There is these, you know, group of bad people that hate America and hate Americans and they're a threat to you in our way of life. That's been said over and over again by different people. And at the same time, there'll be fictional stories where they'll say, you know, there'll be movies where these people who the government says are a threat to you are the villains in those movies. And you see it and your subconscious mind and you as a person absorbs this psychologically. And you're like, oh, these are bad people. These are our enemy. The government tells you who your enemy is and who we're up against, right? Like right now it's on a big scale, it's Russia and China, but then there's these smaller groups and domestic groups, all of which are bad people who are against you. The media, the government have categorized three major threats. Who are the major threats you hear about and you also see in TV shows and documentaries and things like this that are put together and the news media. Right now you have Russia and China. North Korea is there. Iran is always there, right? These are, you know, part of the so-called axis of evil under Bush. Two of those countries, the last two countries are a part of that. And so those are threats. America's got to be strong. Our military's got to be strong because these people want to come and take your stuff, and they don't like Americans and American lifestyle. And then you have these so-called Islamic terrorists, right, these groups now, ISIS-K, 
used to be the Taliban and these other groups. And those are groups you'd see in movies, featured in movies. And then there's like the disgruntled Republican Trump supporting type of um, right wing conspiracy theorist type of people like the Cubies. And so those are a domestic threat. And you see this on TV and they tell you about these people and how dangerous they are. And then they do something. And you have been prepped to blame it on that group. Like, you know who did it right before they even tell you. You hear about it and you mentally say, oh, I bet it was this group. I bet it was that group. And so Joju Magoo comes out and says, you know, we're working with the Taliban. And I'll get into that later. I'll explain why they had to do it this way. It couldn't have been the Taliban. And then he brings out a new enemy, a new, you know, it's a new villain. It's, a, it's an old villain with a new twist, a twist of K. It's got a K twist, right? <laughs> they put a little K twist on an old villain. And the next day, that villain attacks Americans and American soldiers. And Joe Biden is now changing the narrative, which I'll show you. I'll demonstrate how they, they've changed the narrative and they're flipping something that was a failure and trying to turn JoJo into a hero. They're a part of an airlift, an evacuation effort unlike any scene in history, with more than 100,000 American citizens, American partners. He almost looks like he's like spaced out and like got drugged up or something here. But this is where he's bragging about how well we're doing in the evacuation, which no one wants to hear about, right? Afghans who helped us and others taken to safety in the last 11 days. Just in the last 12 hours or so, another 7,000 have gotten out. They were part of the bravest, most capable, the most selfless military on the face of the earth. And they're part of simply what I call the backbone of America. Again, he's trying to, you know, like he's a part of that, and he's obviously not, right? They're the spine of America, the best the country has to offer. Jill and I, our hearts ache, like I'm sure all of you do as well, for all those... Well, you got to have... <laughs> you have to have a heart for it to ache, Magoo. Those Afghan families who lost loved ones, including small children or been wounded in this vicious attack. And we're outraged as well as heartbroken. <clears throat> Being the father of a army major who served for a year in Iraq and before that was in Kosovo. See, he's linking his son to this, right? His son had no reason to go to the military. He's got a crackhead son, which he doesn't want to talk about, doesn't want to, you know, bring up his, he doesn't mention his crackhead son or his crackhead son stripper baby in his speeches. You know, my, my one son, he's, he's fighting, he's fighting a, with a crack pipe right now and a crack hoe. You know, like, he doesn't bring that son up. But he had a son who went into the military because he was probably going to go into politics, and then he died of some sort of brain cancer or something like that, right? And then he's got his crackhead son he doesn't talk about. But he's... You know, saying right here, he's a father that had a son who fought in, the, in these wars or whatever, these wars that he's now saying he was against, that we should never have been there, but he sent his son over there. And now he's, you know, trying to link his son to what's happened in the last, you know, whatever, 24 hours over there, the last, I don't know, eight hours ago at the time he's given the speech. He's trying to be a part of the military family, the soldiers. As a U.S. attorney for better part of six months in the middle of a war. When he came home after a year in, a, in Iraq, he was diagnosed, like many, many coming home, with an aggressive and lethal cancer of the brain. We lost. We have some sense, like many of you do, what the families of these brave heroes are feeling today. So again... Like his son dying from cancer of the brain, which he's now saying had something to do with his time in Iraq, that he was exposed to something. I mean, I'm not sure what he's implying here, but his loss of his son, he's now trying to link it to the families who've lost service members 
because of this, whatever, you know, attack or whatever it was, or just the effort itself. Like he's trying to say, I'm like you, I'm a father of a soldier, and he's trying to, you know, hone in on that. But there's nothing in his character or personality that make me think that he cares or is a caring person. And he's not some jaded, hard politician. Because right now, this is manipulative. This is manipulation where he's trying to, they're trying to change the narrative of him completely failing in Afghanistan. And they're going back to this old trick that they use of introducing a new enemy and trying to rally the, the forces of camaraderie of Americans to back a commander in chief when the country is under attack, right? You get this feeling like you're being sucked into a black hole in the middle of your chest. Yeah, you've been getting that feeling for a while. We know you have a feeling of being sucked into a black hole. There's no way out. My heart aches for you. But I know this. We have a continuing obligation, <clears throat> a sacred obligation to all of you, families of those heroes. That obligation is not temporary. It lasts forever. Eternity? Like, are you talking about eternity? Are you talking a million years from now? It's forever? Forever, ever? Feel like this forever, 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 ever, forever, ever. The lives we lost today were lives given in the service of liberty, the service of security, and the service of others. In the service of America, like their fellow brothers and sisters in arms who died defending our vision and our values in the struggle against terrorism, of the fall on this day, they're part of a great and noble company of American heroes. To those who carried out this attack. Okay, so this is where he's going to turn, right? So he's been somber Jojo Magoo, and he's been, you know, trying to be empathetic. And now he's going to switch. He's going to be the get off my lawn, come on, man, Jojo Magoo starts yelling. As well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. He's getting tough. He's getting, he's a little badass. He's getting tough here. We're not going to forgive. We're not going to forget. We're going to remember this forever, forever, ever, forever, ever, ever, ever. We're going to remember this. I'm a tough guy, Magoo. I don't take any bullets. We will hunt you down and make you pay. We're going to hunt you down and make you pay. I'm going to charge you double. You're going to get charged double, even triple, triple charge. I'm going to make you pay big time, Buster. Buster Brant, Buster. <laughs> and so um, I saw this last night on CNN and MSNBC. And I was just watching the news for a little bit, and I hadn't seen the speech. And I'm like, oh, and, they're, and they were talking about how, like, he was being fierce and they were changing the narrative. They had been going after him, right? So think about what happened here. Because now there's a much more positive narrative for JoJo. He has a winning line that they've created here where they're reversing the narrative on Afghanistan. When something that should be blamed on him is actually being turned into an asset and the media is going along with it. Instead of blaming him, for, you know, this debacle and something worse happened to a situation that was already deteriorating. But he, you know, they created this situation a day earlier. And attacked both U.S. and allied forces and innocent civilians. Every day we're on the ground is another day we know that ISIS-K is seeking to target the airport and attack both U.S. and allied forces and innocent civilians. And then it happens. Like, it just happens the next day. Harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. And he gets to do this. Like, he gets to be in front of a camera, a million miles away from these guys, right, on the other side of the world, and talk tough like he's going to, 
you know, you know, right? And um, this is them spinning this, trying to create a change in the narrative of his debacle. Before the uh, before this event, this was the morning of, right? So when this thing happened, it was like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And I woke up to this headline, or was it from the night before? It doesn't matter. Afghanistan exit may leave a political stain on the president and his party. And so that was happening. You know, that's what they were covering. And then the next day, this is, you know, Biden vows to retaliate. I mean, all these various headlines. Biden vows to retaliate against terrorists who killed U.S. military in Afghanistan. Now they're trying to flip the script here. Taliban leader reaches out to the West, promises rights for Afghan women. We'll come back to that because that's where an enemy becomes a friend. What is the ISIS-K, Islamic State's groups affiliate behind Kabul airport attack? And then, you know, they got this woman here and they're just saying all these things, right? As you were talking, uh, I understand that ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack there in Afghanistan, which is what uh, all the military thinkers and, and even the general suggested. That was the belief that ISIS may have, may have been behind these attacks today. Uh, given that fact, given that the general said... So we just heard about this one day ago. We didn't even know this group existed. And they claimed something. You know, ISIS was a... I mean, the original ISIS was, you know, likely a CIA asset because the CIA has these assets that they use. And this is what Biden wants. He wants to, you know, use intelligence and stealth to go into these countries and deal with these so-called threats without having to launch a whole military invasion. That's his whole new policy. And this is, you know, that fits right into his policy and the reason why he says we need to leave Afghanistan, you know, all wrapped up in a neat little convenient package, right? In his briefing, we will go after those responsible. 24-7, we are looking for them, is what he said. Does this change the trajectory of what's happening on the ground there in Afghanistan in terms of the military operation, in terms of the evacuation? It changes the trajectory, the trajectory of the media and your coverage. That's what it changes. All of a sudden, instead of attacking Biden, you're covering this story. He's giving you some other, you know, vehicle of something that you guys can fill your 24-hour news network with instead of bashing him for his incompetence. That's what it changes. You know, this is wagging the dog, the wagging the dog movie. We saw it, right? This is how the CIA rolls and politicians roll. Like every politician, I mean, the politicians on every issue, they're all about looking good. That's what politicians try to do is be, you know, on the right side of things, the things that the way the Americans are going to view them. They, they want a positive narrative. They want to be portrayed as the hero, not the villain, not some doddering, incompetent fool. And so he wants to look like a hero on this Afghanistan thing instead of the complete, you know, miserable piece of crap he's been, right, in the way that this has gone down. So they're trying to change the, the narrative here. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. Over the past few weeks, <clears throat> I know you're, many of you are probably tired of hearing me say it, we've been made aware by our intelligence community that the ISIS-K, an arch enemy, the Taliban. So this is the arch enemy of the Taliban, right? Taliban leader reaches out to the West, promises rights for women, rights for Afghan women. This is the headline. Taliban leader reaches out to the West, promises rights for Afghan women. And this is what's said here. And not everyone will make it. Last night, I spoke to Zabiullah Mujahid, the Taliban spokesman and a senior official. He arrived with an armed entourage. He's been doing interviews by phone in hiding for years. This is one of his first ever one-on-one -on -one face to face interviews. The United States is Richard Ingalls talking to the Taliban leader who's now an asset and an ally. So this flies in the face of what we are told about the Taliban for years. We were told in 2001 that the group that had just perpetrated some horrific act against America was in Afghanistan being protected by the so-called Taliban.
And as long as the Taliban were in power, it would be a refuge for bad actors like this. That's what we were told. That's the official story. This guy was telling it, right? All these guys, they were all about it. He voted for these wars. He talked big. He talked patriotic and things like this. So this is Jojo Magoo. He's reading this essay, this sort of patriotic essay from some um, some uh, a professor in Delaware, you know, his home state. And then he goes on to say this. This is on the Oprah Winfrey show in 2001. And we will win this battle again. He is absolutely dead positively right. They do not have the capacity to take this nation down. They don't have the capacity. And look, what the president is doing here, to tell your audience, the president is doing the right thing. If he, and he President Bush is doing the right thing. So he's backing President Bush, right, in terms of what was going on in the Afghanistan war. And she'd keep his eye on the ball here. He has put together a coalition that includes everyone from Russia to China to the United Nations to Pakistan to the Middle Eastern Arab nations. Because as I said, they understand this is no longer, they're, they're not able to play geopolitics anymore, meaning as... She's, and she's nodding in, in agreement, so her audience knows, oh, this guy's telling the truth here. That's all right if these crazy Afghanis go off and do this thing because it hurts the guy that's our enemy. I understand enemy. it could have been them. It's okay if the crazy Afghanistan does this, Afghanistan guy. No guy in Afghanistan did anything. Afghanistan, this didn't come from Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden was from Saudi Arabia. He wasn't from Afghanistan, right? I mean, think about what he just said here. Some crazy Afghanistan, Afghanis, right? I mean, that's all right if these crazy Afghanis go off and do this thing because of... Crazy Afghanis. There was no Afghanis. This was not an Afghan war. It was supposed to be against the Taliban. Hurts the guy that's they our understand enemy. understand it could have been them. Exactly. It could have been exactly. Them. So this is George W. Bush, the president that Jojo Magoo was backing in 2001, and he had this to say. Good afternoon. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. So they were doing regime change, right? The Taliban regime change. And then Joe, Joe Magul said this. This is what he said in 2001. First, our immediate goal is to cut off the head of al-Qaeda, break up the network, leave them no safe haven. That means, to state the obvious, the removal of bin Laden, Mullah Omar, and the Taliban leadership. I don't know how long it will be before the regime is toppled. I don't know how long it will be before the regime is toppled. Regime change. Get rid of the Taliban. This is the Council of Foreign Relations, which is, in, you know, in the truth community, if you don't know, CFR, but these are... You know, this is a Rockefeller organization, and it's about foreign relations and all these types of um, neocon and the stuff that was going on back then. And so he's speaking in front of a, you know, group of insiders here. And he is saying that right now, when he is backing, they had to get rid of the Taliban regime change in Afghanistan. This is what Joe Biden said. This is what Bush said. This was the policies. He was all behind it, right? He was all for it. After al-Qaeda and the Taliban fall, to use the phrase of the day, when we drain the swamp, as the president says. Drain the swamp. <laughs> the medium-term goal is to roll up all al-Qaeda cells around the world. And so the regime change was the policy, right? This is in 2001, get rid of the Taliban. And so in 2021... 20 years later. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. Over the past few weeks, <clears throat> I know you're, many of you are probably tired of hearing me say it, we've been made aware by our intelligence community that the ISIS-K, an arch enemy, the Taliban, the arch enemy of the Taliban. I got off it 
off, I got off track here because, you know, the Taliban was the enemy. Remember back in this, you know, when we went into the war in the first place, we were told the Taliban were housing these groups, these bad actors. And the only way for America to be safe was to remove the Taliban from power completely. They were going to be gone, crushed. And then even though he says he's not for it now, I'll show you this later, that he's not for regime change and nation building. Back then he was when he was talking to the CFR. And so this is where, you know, an enemy has now become an ally. But anyways, we heard what he said about Afghanistan way back when. He was for the war, voted for the war. He was backing President Bush back then and with the same kind of rhetoric. This guy, Jojo Magul now, right, and much, um, I mean, he's not as sharp as he was back then. Not that he wasn't, you know, his, he didn't have his issues back then, but he's clearly um, having mental issues now, deterioration. He has just handed this Taliban regime that him and Bush were talking about how it needed to be toppled, $88 billion in training and weapons, $166 $20 million Black Hawk helicopters and things like this, right? He's just handed them the state-of-the-art American weaponry and training. I um, meant to say this. I'm in the editing process again. I'm <laughs> adding something here. Um, I meant to say this. I was talking to my brother for a while, and he had this conversation with a general. I talked about this before in another part of the conversation, but the general also said, to him, that the first Gulf War, the one with um, Schwarzkopf, right, the the old the elder Bush uh, Desert Storm War, could have been prevented. Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait, which was a neighboring ally of the United States, could have been avoided if the U.S. had just armed the Kuwaitis with six Black Hawk helicopters. I mean, it would you know, probably have Americans flying them. But if America had flew in, you know, some helicopter pilots and people to um, fire the, you know, weapons, the power of these things would have turned back Saddam Hussein. Like he, he wouldn't have been able to invade Kuwait. And so, you know, I'd want to emphasize that here, what a disaster this is. The Taliban now have 166 of these, right? I mean, they're so much better off than they were in terms of their, you know, equipment and things. And so he's really screwed, right? Because that wasn't the original goal. And that means a complete failure of the, you know, American mission. But they needed some sort of conflict. They needed an event that would galvanize support behind Joe Joe Biden, Joe Joe Magoo, because, you know, they were attacking him and he was losing credibility and all these things. So they needed something that would bond them together. And it wasn't going to be the Taliban attacking because that would mean we were leaving the country and being attacked on the way out. As we're leaving with our tail between our legs, the Taliban is kicking our ass on the way out the door, right? And that's a bad look for America and a horrible look for him. So it can't be the Taliban. The Taliban has to be redefined. As, the, as a cooperator, an ally. The Taliban are helping us. We're cooperating with the Taliban. They're, they're wanting to treat their women better. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a new Taliban, right? You know, they've reinvented the Taliban as an ally instead of an enemy because they can't be an enemy because we just, you know, handed the country over to them and gave them billions of dollars in weapons. So, we, you know, they can't be... <laughs> We can't be like, hey, the Taliban's attacking us on the way out. No, they're, they're our friends now. Like, they've redefined the narrative. They're changing the story. And so who are they going to get? They need to get somebody that would, you know, act as, a, as an attacker to make him a wartime president. You're probably tired of hearing me say it. We've been made aware by our intelligence community that the ISIS-K, an arch enemy, the Taliban. So the arch enemy of the Taliban. The Taliban's on our side. They just attacked us and the Taliban. So the Taliban is good now. We didn't ever really need this regime change. Now we're going to do something different completely. And, you know, it's this other group. Taliban's good. ISIS-K is bad. 
and he's a hero, and he's a wartime president. So this is how they're changing the narrative, right? It's just so slippery. Like how, you know, and I mean, people are going to fall for it because they always do. The media certainly is going to go along with this. I was just tur- I was just watching, I ate my breakfast. I was watching CNN, and they're back in this narrative and asking questions. And all of a sudden, they're not talking about what a, a sloppy and incompetent job he did. So they flipped the script here. People who were freed when both those prisons were opened has been planning a complex set of attacks on the United States personnel and others. This is why, from the outset, I've repeatedly said this mission was extraordinarily dangerous and why I've been so determined to limit the duration of this mission. So he's saying that the longer it goes on, the more chance there are for these attacks. Like he's trying to claim that his policies were about knowing that this thing was going to happen, right? Something like this was bound to happen. So his policies have been right all along. That's why he's wanting to get out of there as soon as possible. As General McKenzie said, this is why our mission was designed, this is the way it was designed to operate. Operate under severe stress and attack. We've known that from the beginning. And as I've been in constant contact with our senior military leaders, and I mean constant. He always says this, and he criticized Trump for not doing this. Like, I'm always, they're always telling me what's going on, and I'm always there, and I'm always a part of it. And, you know, like he's, right? We know his mental faculties aren't there. Around the clock. And our commanders on the ground and throughout the day. They made it clear that we can and we must complete this mission, and we will. Afghanistan. Every day when I talk to our commanders, I ask them what they need. What more do they need, if anything, to get the job done? As they will tell you, I granted every request. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's like the Wizard of Oz. I re- reiterated them today. Did you give the scarecrow a heart, <laughs> or, your, or 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 yourself one? <laughs> like, hey, on three occasions, that they should take the maximum steps necessary to protect our forces on the ground in Kabul. And I also want to thank the Secretary of Defense and the military leadership of the Pentagon and all the commanders in the field. There has been complete unanimity from every commander on the objectives of this mission. See, he's talking like it's been efficient. Like, now he's trying to sell they've been efficient. So what should be a disaster for him, a mishandled, a misplayed, you know, just the way that he, um, uh, throughout his, you know, throughout this whole thing, this Afghanistan withdrawal thing, it's been incompetent. And he's a bumbling idiot. Like, you just, you know, he's always been one, but now he has some sort of, you know, dementia-type-like symptoms. And so uh, he's a bumbling idiot. The media is setting in on him. And then they have this event that happens that's his fault and his, you know, I mean, all of it, right? I mean, he's responsible for this and should make the narrative go worse, but it's actually getting better. The media is now backing off of criticism of him and saying, oh, we got to back the president. We're under attack, right? This is America. This is one of the, you know, this is one of their tools the CIA's tool and political tools to change American perspective and the, get the media to back off. And the best way to achieve those objectives. Those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah. When the Lord says, whom shall... Are you quoting the Bible here? <laughs> Is he going to burst into flames? Shall I send? Who shall go for us? American military has been answering for a long time. Here I am, Lord, send me. Not Lord. You're not the Lord. Here I am, Lord. They've been, what? And then he, wait, they've got to watch that again. That was brutal. He's not, you know, this is not a religious war. He's making, he's doing what George Bush put this as a religious war. This isn't a religious war. Objectives. Those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah. When the Lord says, whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? 
American military has been answering for a long time. Here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. Wow, that's some greasy stuff right there. Each one of these women and men of our armed forces are the heirs of that tradition of sacrifice, of volunteering to go in harm's way, to risk everything, not for glory, not for profit, but to defend what we love and the people we love. And I ask that you join me now in a moment of silence for all those in uniform and out, uniform. military and civilian. Military and civilian. People and animals, trees and, and bugs and all, you know, everything. We've given the last full measure of devotion. See, you know, and I'm, I'm big into internalizing things, right? You know, I meditate and I talk about internalizing one's relationship with God and prayer. So this, I'm not against something like this, but not when it's fake, right? This isn't real. This isn't him really praying. And for what, right? This was a failed, this was a mistake. America went in and wrecked another country and made another country worse. Our military industrial complex and George W. Bush and him and, you know, they lied to everybody and now they're changing the story and it was a, you know, it was a disaster. I guess he said amen there. It was a disaster, right? It was, you know, 20 years and as much as $2 trillion, he said one or two, he doesn't know. Could be one, could be two. Who cares? What's with that extra trillion dollars? And then all the lives lost. But it's all the lies, right? And just admit it. Like, just admit the truth about what our country is. I mean, I, you know, then our country would collapse, right? <laughs> we're an evil empire. Like, this is, you know, we're, a, you know, we're a militaristic evil empire that imposes its will to keep a failing debt-based economy going. This is what this is about. And, you know... I mean, it's as far as the CIA goes and any intelligence agency, their job is to lie, their job is deception, and their job is to withhold information. They operate in, you know, cloak and dagger. They operate in the in the realm of darkness and the shadows, and they keep the system going. Some ways, you know, sometimes they they f up, whatever it might be, but they keep a dysfunctional system going. Like I don't get mad at any of these groups, or even Biden, that's why it can be calm in this, because we're all part of a dysfunctional, materialistic system that's crumbling. And we can watch it crumble and, you know, get laughs out of it. I mean, that's what I offer here. But it's something where we have to change our orientation to the world and connect to God, because we have an ego-driven system, and this is how ego-driven systems end. You know, the ego is a potential demon or a potential devil. The ego run amok without bowing before the soul, bowing before the part of you that's God, the part of you connected to the source, is a potential demon or a devil. Your ego has to bow before your soul. Your ego has to surrender to your soul's path and embrace, you know, difficult things and things that the ego doesn't necessarily want to go through. So that's, you know, everybody's battle. It's an internalized battle. And our system is removing the soul, right? You have, from my earlier coverage, Harvard, that is saying the guy in charge of religion in Harvard's an atheist. That's, you know, that's the direction we're going. The religion of science and the religion of, of basically Satanism, the worship of the ego. Thank you. You're welcome. May God bless you all, and may God protect his troops and all those standing watch for America. We have so much to do it's within our capacity to do it. You know, it would God bless the troops if you didn't say that. <laughs> if you didn't pray for it. Like, you know, what do you think would happen, right? What you do when you pray and when you do it, you meditate, then two different things. But you're bringing whatever's going on in the material world in front of God and the part of you that's God, your soul. And you are, you know, activating. It's like the body sends out, you know, if you're in pain, the body sends signals to the brain. It says, all right, go do these things, right? And the heart and it, you know, ministers a, a response from your immune system or whatever it might be, right? If there's something wrong, you need to get 
a signal back to the source. And so that's what you do. You offer it up to God and say, just in case you didn't know about this, or you know, maybe you're not aware of this God, or you know, maybe you're not, you know, I just want to bring this to your attention, right? And that's all you can do. And then let God decide what needs to happen. There's perfection in the system. We just have to remain steadfast. Steadfast. We will complete our mission, and we will continue after our troops are withdrawn to find means by which we can find any American who wishes to get out of Afghanistan. So once the troops are gone, they're going to have to find ways to get, you know, with the help of the Taliban, who's now the ally, to get Americans out. And so this is what he's trying to he just propose that BS, right? That wouldn't have flew. He wouldn't have said this two days ago, right, when he gave this speech about the withdrawal, that we were going to leave Americans behind and the troops were going to come home and the Americans were going to have to find their way home through some other means. He's just said it, right? Now this event has allowed him to do this and the media is going to accept it because I watched them and they already have. Steadfast. We will complete our mission and we will continue after our troops are withdrawn to find means by which we can find any American who wishes to get out of Afghanistan. He's leaving Americans there. They weren't, you know, all the Democrats and Republicans and the media were saying, don't take the troops out and then leave Americans behind. He's saying they're going to do that and trust the Taliban to fight off um, ISIS-K and get the Americans home somehow. This is what he just said, right? And there's no way he could have said that 48 hours ago in his other speech where he introduced ISIS-K, that we were going to take the troops out and leave Americans behind. He just, you know, I mean, this is what this is all about and try to make him look like a hero in the process. Look at this greasy, slimy, m and or It's not him. It's his handlers. It's the intelligence community. I mean, it's all of it. This is some greasy stuff right here. Again, like, I don't know if any of it's true. I don't even know if Afghanistan exists, right? You know, like, I mean, I'm just trusting. Like, I've never been there. I don't, you know, whatever. But in terms of the narrative that they're pitching here, what we're seeing, this was a failed war that, you know, the reason we went there, which, which was to get rid of the Taliban, that he said it himself, right? First, our immediate goal is to cut off the head of al-Qaeda, break up the network, leave them no safe haven. That means, to state the obvious, the removal of bin Laden, Mullah Omar, and the Taliban leadership. I don't know how long it will be before the regime is toppled. So, back then, and again, he, this isn't his policy, he's reading what he's told to read. This has been the military-industrial complex's policy. They're going to go to Afghanistan. And they were going to get rid of the Taliban, which didn't happen, was never the goal. They were going to allow, they were going to open up the opium industry, the poppy fields, because the, the Taliban were stopping that. There was going to be an opioid crisis that came from Afghanistan, Afghanistan opium. I've showed you that in other videos. That spiked, its production spiked at a worldwide high in terms of production in 2008, 9, and 10, and that's when the opioid crisis began in 2010 in America. It's interesting that that happened, a, not, a country occupied by America. You know, my brother guarded the poppy fields in Vietnam, and he told me about that. And we saw American troops doing the same, so that happened. And then, you know, after 20 years, we're leaving and handing over all of these weapons to the Taliban, right? And so this happened. This is a failure. It's a failed war. We are lied to. And, you know, I mean, there's no accountability here. And he was going to take responsibility for the debacle of the exit, which was going to be rough, and so many people knew about it. And now he's trying to turn himself into a hero as a doddering old fool, and the media is going with this right now. We will find them, and we will get them out. Ladies we'll find gentlemen. them after. We'll find them after the troops have left. I mean, that's what he just said. 
we're going to leave Americans behind and we'll fight them and get them out, right? After this event that just happened that showed that they're not safe and Americans are being targeted by a group that somehow the Taliban can't control and who are sworn enemies of the Taliban in America, he just said, leaving Americans there. And this is, nobody's covering this, what he just said. This is an epic statement on his part. Like a complete, like, shit show, right? Shit storm. And they're just leaving that on the table. They gave me a list here. The first person I was instructed to call on was Kelly O'Donnell of NBC. <clears throat> you have said leaving Afghanistan is in the national interest of the United States. After today's attack, do you believe you will authorize additional forces to respond to that attack inside Afghanistan? And are you, are you prepared to add additional forces to protect those Americans who remain on the ground carrying out the evacuation operation? I've instructed the military, whatever they need, if they need additional force, I will grant it. But the military from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Joint Chiefs, the commanders in the field have all contacted me one way or another, usually by letter, saying they subscribe to the mission as designed. By letter? <laughs> we have this thing now called the Internet. To get as many people out as we can within the time frame that is allotted. That is the best way they believe to get as many Americans out as possible and others. No, it isn't. And with it regard to finding. It would be staying. It would be staying until every, having the military stay there. Your, your military is leaving Americans in a hostile country. And so just think about, I mean, it's just epic what he's saying here. Like in just, it's, it's being passed over. Tracking down. The ISIS leaders who ordered this. With what? There's no military there in Afghanistan. You're going to drone them? Like the Taliban are there on the ground and they're sworn enemies and they can't find them? And you're saying that you're going to find them with no military presence over there? We have some reason to believe we know who they are. Not certain. They're not certain. <laughs> they don't even know. But he's going to get them. And we will find ways of our choosing without large military operations to get them. Wherever they are. Um, They're in Afghanistan. <laughs> A country you're leaving right now. Trevor Reuters. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there's been some criticism, uh, even from people in your party, about the dependence on the Taliban to secure the perimeter of the airport. Do you, do you feel like there was a, a mistake uh, made in that regard? No, I, I, I don't. Look, um, I think General McKenzie handled this question very well. The fact is that we're in a situation we inherited the situation, particularly since, as we all know, that the Afghan military collapsed 11 days before, in 11 days. Which everyone knew was going to happen. It is in the interest of, as McKenzie said, in the interest of the Taliban that, in fact, ISIS-K... Boom. Again with the eye there does not metastasize beyond what it is, number one. And number two, it's in their interest that we are able to leave on time, on target. And as a consequence of that, the major things we've asked them, moving back the perimeter, giving more space between the wall, stopping vehicles from coming through, et cetera, searching people coming through. It is not what you'd call a tightly commanded, regimented operation like the U.S. is, 
military is, but they're acting in their interest. They're getting it done. These guys are, they're, they're our allies now. They're our friends. Mr. Taliban, he's Tali and JoJo's banana. Their interest. And so, by and large, and I've asked the same question to military on the ground, whether or not it's a useful exercise, no one trusts them. We're just counting on their self-interest to continue to generate their activities. <laughs> what? Are they playing Twister? Like, what do you mean activities? <laughs> Are they playing capture the flag? <laughs> like, what's... And it's in their self-interest that we leave when we said and that we get as many people out as we can not all of like them I, but not all of them said even in the midst of everything that happened today over 7000 people we've gotten out over 5000 americans over so uh, it's not a matter of trust it's a matter of mutual self interest and uh, but there is no evidence thus far that i've been given as a consequence by any of our commanders in the field that there has been collusion between the Taliban and ISIS in carrying out what happened today, both in front of the hotel and what is expected to continue. So understand what happened here. That this event, right, you would look at this event, like you, when I heard it, I'm like, wow, he's, Jojo Magul is going to take a beating for this thing. But then I saw the way me, the media was spinning it and based on what he said, and this event, he is allowed now to say something that he wasn't able to say two days ago, right? So he said that they were going to get out on time, and all the media and the Democrats, even many of the Democrats were like, we can't, we can't leave people behind. If you get out on August 31st, you're going to leave Americans behind. And JoJo was, you know, at the G7. I get, you showed you parts of that speech already today. I covered it the other day. And then he, they said, all right, he's going to talk in about, uh, you know, very shortly. And that went on for five hours. And they had to come up with a plan. And he came out and said, oh, we're talking about the military, about contingencies and backup plans in case we have to stay. But he didn't really say it like that. But there was a backup plan that's now emerged. Think about what's happened in the past 24 hours. So Jojo Magul couldn't even have said anything hinted at leaving Americans behind. That wasn't on the table. Now this event happens, which is, you know, would justify keeping a military presence there and getting all the Americans out safely. But instead of doing that, which would be, you know, going in line with the typical American agenda of no man left behind, he's saying we're getting the military out and we're trusting the Taliban because of their self-interest and their hate for ISIS-K to get Americans out safely when our military is no longer there. And that's what he's just been allowed to say by the media. I mean, just think about it, right? Because of an event that is really should be the cherry on top of this debacle and should pretty much end his presidency. You for uh, beyond today. Um, Amir, Associated Press. Oh, th thank you, Mr. President. You have spoken. Um... The media is very soft, right? They're, you know, because of this event, they don't want to be like aggressive, and you know, they're they don't want to criticize a commander or chief when he's in a wartime moment. I mean, think about the change in tone here. Again, powerfully about. Uh, your own son, and the weight of these decisions. <laughs> his own son. He's echoing the thing about his own son, right? His own son died of brain cancer and was protected. He was never going to die in battle. I mean, unless they were trying to prop him up in some sort of sacrificial way. I mean, you know. But he, what, what the crackhead? Are you talking about the crackhead? <laughs> the guy who fathered a stripper baby that... You know, a, a stripper named Dallas who lives in Arkansas when he was on crack 
and Jojo Magoo won't, won't acknowledge his grandchild? You mean that, that son? With that in mind, and also what you've said, um, that the longer we stay, the more likelihood that there would be a major attack. How do you weigh staying even one more day considering what's happened? <laughs> you should get out. You should have got out yesterday. <laughs> Leave those Americans behind. Like, look at this guy just spoon feeling. <laughs> that guy's great. <laughs> Let's get more from this guy. I want this guy more. We want to hear more from that guy. Because I think what America says matters. What we say we're going to do in the context in which we say we're going to do it, that we do it. You mean regime change that you and George Bush said that I just showed you 20 years ago? And instead of doing the exact opposite of giving the Taliban $88 billion worth of weapons, you know, that kind of thing, right? Unless something exceptional changes. There are additional American citizens. There are additional green card holders. There are additional personnel of our allies. There are additional SIV card holders. There are additional Afghans that have helped us. And there are additional groups of individuals that have been contacted us from women's groups. There's some women's groups, al -Anon. There's some women's groups over there. To NGOs and others who have expressly indicated they want to get out and have gathered in certain circumstances in groups on buses and other means that still presents the opportunity for in the next several days between now and the 31st to be able to yeah we'll get as many of them out as we can and then you know taliban will help us out able to get them out and our military and i believe to the extent that we can do that knowing the threat knowing that we may very well have another attack the military has concluded that's what we should do i think they're right he thinks they're right he's not sure but it's going to be their fault if it you know like i don't know i just listen to the military i don't know to make decisions i think they're correct I've been waiting to find a spot to add this, so I'm just going to add it here. He said over and over again, one of his campaign promises was that he was going to work with experts and he wasn't going to just make decisions like a, you know, like Trump was on his own without listening to the experts and the power players and all these things. That he was going to bring back political stability to an outsider. You know, Joe Biden is the ultimate insider. He's been you know, well, he's had one job and has been a politician his whole life, right? He got elected when he was 29 years old, a relatively young man as a senator from a small state, and he's a lifer. And so he said over and over in this press conference, I'm listening to my generals, I'm in constant contact with them, and they say this and that, and the military brass and the intelligence community, all of which had a massive fail in these wars, right? Every one of these wars during the so-called Arab Spring and the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the so-called intelligence behind the wars has been a failure. You know, it's come out in every one of these countries, every one of these reasons we went into war has turned out not to be true and based in deception. I'm not talking just about like truth or narratives. I'm talking about mainstream or other countries even, like Britain, for example, and Libya saying that the reasons were given by the UN and America and France to go into Libya turned out to be completely false. We know this stuff from Colin Powell in Iraq and now in Afghanistan as well. And then in a post-Vietnam War world and military and insurgent fighting, America has you know botched all these wars in different ways and left the countries a mess and you know the wars didn't succeed. And these are the guys who plan this exit in the first place as well. And so they failed for years. They keep on failing. It's an intelligence failure. It's a military strategy failure. It's a lack of adapting to 
the way these wars had to be fought on a, a level of insurgency, getting America bogged down, and they failed over and over again. You know, they did the same thing when the economy collapsed and the bankers and the people on Wall Street, the heavy hitters on Wall Street, who wrecked the economy in 2008, were given the, the task of fixing it, right? Instead of going to jail, they put them in charge of fixing the economy and coming up with solutions. They were rewarded for their failure. And now he's saying, let's trust these guys, <laughs> these generals. We trust them, even though they failed up to this part. And Jojo Magoo had an epic failure yesterday, you know, last night or whatever it was, yesterday. And he's being rewarded by, instead of scrutinizing him more and saying he's failing, they're now, you know, covering his his wisdom, right, and what a great job he's doing. I mean, this is, you know, the ultimate in madness. And after that, we're going to be in a uh, circumstance where there are, will be, I believe, numerous opportunities to continue to provide access for additional persons to get out of Afghanistan, either through means that we provide and or are provided through in cooperation with the Taliban. They're not the Taliban's going to take care of the the people we leave behind. They're you know they're good guys now. They're going to help our anybody we abandon over there. The Taliban's going to take care of them. You know we just gave them a shit ton of weapons and stuff, and you know. They want a, the seat at the table of the international community. And so, I mean, forget about what I said 20 years ago. We, well, The Taliban are now our friends over there. They're our allies. They're going to take care of us. Not good guys, the Taliban. We're not suggesting that at all. So they're bad guys and you're depending on bad guys. <laughs> they're not good guys. <laughs> you're depending on them to get Americans out, right, and to protect Americans from ISIS K, the new badass in town. Beware of ISIS K. Not regular ISIS. It's got a K at the end. But they have keen interest. As many of you have been reporting, they very much would like to figure out how to keep the airport open. They don't have the capacity to do it. They very much are trying to figure out whether or not they can uh, maintain what is a portion of an economy that has become not robust, but fundamentally different than it had been. You know, because when you sell opium, you know, to, to his son, <laughs> his crackhead son, when you have a, a, you know, a robust product like opium, poppy fields, you know, we're, we're trying to persuade them. We don't want to get rid of those things because, you know, you need an open airport to get that opium out of, out of Kabul. And so there's a lot of reasons why they have reached out, not just to us, but to others, as to why it would be continued in their interest to get more of the personnel we want to get out, we can locate them. Now, there's not many left that we can assess that are, want to come out. There's some Americans we've identified, we've contacted the vast majority of them, not all of them, who don't want to leave because they have they're dual nationals, they have extended families, et cetera. And there's others who uh, are looking for the time. So that's why we continue. Looking for the time? <laughs> continue. I'll take a few more questions and, uh, but uh, you, sir. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you you say that what America says matters. Um, what do you say to the Afghans who helped tr troops um, who may not be able to get out by August 31st? I what, say we're going to continue to try to get you out. It matters. Look, I know of no conflict as a student of history, no conflict where when a war was ending, one side was able to guarantee that everyone they wanted to be extracted from that country 
would get out. And think about it, folks. I think it's important. For, I know the American people get this in their gut. It's just, uh, he studies history. You know, you're you're going to leave some people behind that helps us out and some of our own citizens. And the, and the, and the, you know, the regime change that you wanted didn't work out and you're handing it back to the Taliban. So now you got to depend on them. That happens all the time. And it always works out great. There are, I would argue, millions of Afghani citizens who are not Taliban, who did not actively cooperate with us as SIVs, who if given a chance, they'd be on board a plane tomorrow. It sounds ridiculous, but the vast majority of people in communities like that want to come to America given a choice. So getting every single person out is can't be guaranteed by anybody because there's a determination all who wants to get out as well. At any rate, it's a process. I was really pointing to you, but you, sir. Uh, <laughs> I actually got the wrong guy, and he asked me a real question. <laughs> and I deflected. I think I did a good job on that one. Um, thank you, Mr. President. There are reports that... U.S. officials provided the Taliban with names of Americans and Afghan officials uh, to evacuate. Were you aware of that? Did that happen? And then, sir, did you personally reject a recommendation to hold or to recapture Bagram Air Force Base? Here's what I've done. On the, let's ask this, answer the last question first. On the tactical questions of how to conduct an evacuation or a war, I gather up all the major military personnel that are in Afghanistan, the commanders, as well as the Pentagon. And I ask for their best military judgment. What would be the most efficient way to accomplish the mission? They concluded. The and then I do the exact opposite because I'm like that. <laughs> the military that Bagram was not much value added, that it was much wiser to focus on Kabul. And so I followed that recommendation. With regard to, there are certain circumstances where we've gotten information, and quite frankly, sometimes from some of you, saying you know of such and such a group of people or trying to get out and they're on a bus. You're relying on these guys to tell you who to find people in Afghanistan. <laughs> these shills, these media dopes. Sometimes you guys tell us where the where the folks are that we have to get out of the country. I appreciate it. <laughs> they're moving from other people. And this is their location. And there have been occasions when our military has contacted their military counterparts in the Taliban and said this, for example, this bus is coming through with X number of people on it, made up of the following group of people. We want you to let that bus or that group through. So yes, there have been occasions like that. And to the best of my knowledge. What he asked was, has America given locations of Americans and or Afghanis who've cooperated with America to the Taliban who are going, who are likely to want to hurt them? Do they know where they, did you actually, you know, give the enemy locations of vulnerable Americans and Af in worse Afghanistan people, Afghani citizens who work with the Americans who the Taliban are going to target? And you're not answering that question. You kind of are. You're saying, hey, there's a bus we want to get through, but do they know where they live? Do they know where these people are staying? In those cases, the bulk of that has occurred. They've been let through. But I can't tell you with any certitude that there's actually been a list of names. I know there may have been, but I know of no circumstance. It doesn't mean it's not, it didn't exist. That here's the names of 12 people. They're coming, let them through. It could very well have happened. I'll take one more. And they might have been given names. I don't know. It's important they know the name. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. They can just give a fake name. I don't know. What do I know? 
One more question. Wait, 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 wait. Let me take the one question from the most interesting guy that I know in the press. That's you. Mr. President, there had not been a U.S. service member killed in combat in Afghanistan since February of 2020. You set a deadline, you pulled troops out, you sent troops back in, and now 12 Marines are dead. You said the buck stops with you. Do you bear any responsibility for the way that things have unfolded in the last two weeks? I bear responsibility for fundamentally all that's happened of late. But here's the deal. Does that include ordering ISIS-K to attack? <laughs> I'm asking for a friend here. Do you bear responsibility for that as well? You know, I wish you'd one day say these things. You know, as well as I do, that a former president made a deal with the Taliban. Here he goes. He's taking full responsibility and then immediately blames Trump. Right? <laughs> that he would get all American forces out of Afghanistan by May 1. In return, the commitment was made, and that was a year before. In return, he was given a commitment that the Taliban would continue to attack others, but would not attack any American forces. Others, but not American. Remember that? No, I don't. Did you tell us about it? Maybe a hundred times? I'm, I'm being serious. I, no, I, I'm asking you a question. Be, uh, because no, before... No, 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 wait a minute. I'm asking you a question. Is that, you said the most interesting guy in the room, and now all of a sudden you turned on him. Is that accurate, the best of you or not? What? Are you praying again, bro? What's happening? you praying. There's Caitlin Collins. <laughs> People have an issue with pulling out of that big stand or just the way that things have happened. I think they have an issue that people are likely to get hurt. Some, as we've seen, have gotten killed. And that it is messy. It's messy, but he's, 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 he's responsible for it all. The reason why, whether my friend will acknowledge it, or has reported it, the reason why there were no attacks on Americans, as you said, from the date until I came into office, was because the commitment was made by President Trump, I will be out by May 1st. In the meantime, you agree not to attack any Americans. That was the deal. That's why no American was attacked. A few days ago, you said you squarely stand by your decision to pull out. Yes, I do, because look at it this way, folks. Too bad you didn't do that with Hunter, right? <laughs> You're going to save the world some pain. And I'm going to I have another meeting, for real. For real, it's not imaginary. It isn't like he's going to go back in there and play tiddlywinks. He's got a real official, official big meeting that's official. It's official meeting. But imagine where we'd be if I had indicated... On May the 1st, I was not going to renegotiate an evacuation date. We were going to stay there. I'd have only one alternative. Pour thousands of more troops back into Afghanistan to fight a war that we had already won. You didn't win it. <laughs> this doesn't look like what winning looks like. Relative to why the reason we went in the first place. I have never been of the view that we should be sacrificing American lives to try to establish a democratic government in Afghanistan. That's not what you said, though. After Al-Qaeda and the Taliban fall, to use the phrase of the day, when we drain the swamp, as the president says, the medium-term goal is to roll up all al-Qaeda cells around the world. Then, with the help of other nations and possibly the ultimate sanction of the United Nations, our hope is that we'll see a relatively stable government in Afghanistan. 
That's nation building, bro. You were going to get rid of the Taliban and you were going to build a nation. That's what you said. This is the CFR. That's their, you know, this is, he's actually telling them that their plan that Bush is using, because this is coming from Rockefeller, this is coming from the Rockefeller Foundation here. This is, you know, big money, you know, controlling interests here that are telling, these are their plans that the Pentagon and the Bush administration is rolling out. And he's saying, yeah, we're adopting your plan. In the world, then with the help of other nations and possibly the ultimate sanction of the United Nations, our hope is that we'll see a relatively stable government in Afghanistan. One that does not harbor terrorists, is acceptable to the major players in the region, represents the ethnic makeup of the country and provides the foundation for future reconstruction of that country. So that's regime change and nation building. That's what you're reading here. You're saying you're endorsing this, and now you're saying the exact opposite. So you were wrong 20 years ago. I'm going to come back to this. A country that has never once in its entire history been a united country and is made up, I don't mean this in a derogatory, made up of different tribes who have never, ever, ever gotten along with one another. And so... As I said before, this is the last comment I'll make. We'll have more chance to talk about this, unfortunately, beyond, because we're not out yet. As well as Al-Qaeda had chosen to launch an attack when they left Saudi Arabia out of Yemen, would we have ever gone to Afghanistan? Even though the Taliban completely controlled Afghanistan at the time, yeah, but ISIS is in there now. You have ISIS-K that just attacked Americans and American soldiers. So why are you leaving if there's terrorists there, right? Why are you leaving now because ISIS-K is there, right? It's just, it's this, it's a complete failure. The time. Would we have ever gone? I know it's not fair to ask you questions. It's rhetorical, but raise your hand if you think we should have gone and given up thousands. Nobody raising their hand. <laughs> Raise your hand. The teacher's talking. Thousands of lives and tens of thousands of wounded. Our interest in going was to prevent Al-Qaeda from reemerging. First to get bin Laden, wipe out Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, prevent that from happening again. As I've said a hundred times, you just said, though, it was about nation building. Get rid of the Taliban, have regime change, and establish a democratic government in Afghanistan. That was your plan you read in front of the CFR. You talked about it in multiple places. I played the clips. That's what you voted for. That's what you and Obama were doing for eight years, nation building in, a, in Afghanistan, even though you promised to get out in 2014. And none of these things stand up to any sort of scrutiny if we had a real journalistic media that practiced journalism and asked real questions, none of this would be able to stand, right? Your lies and your deception and your changing of the story wouldn't be able to stand, you know, up to just a little bit of scrutiny and a little bit of fact-checking. Terrorism is metastasized around the world. We have greater threats coming out of other countries, a heck of a lot closer to the United States. We don't have military encampments there. We don't keep people there. We have over the horizon capability to keep them from going after us. Ladies and gentlemen, it was time to end a 20-year war. Thank you so much. Boom. And he goes running away like JoJo do. Okay, so just briefly, you know, the difference between me and probably most people who do this sort of thing, whether you're a truther or not, people comment on these things is that I see this as a systemic problem. Like I mock JoJo and these, you know, tools, uh, the media and all these people for engaging in this. But anybody who's sitting in this position as president has to engage in stuff like this to keep the system going. They have to rearrange reality, lie, create deceptions to keep the perception of the system going. They have to convince people. And, you know, people... There's lots of people who fall for this. They can't see through it. And if they could, the system would collapse. 
because it's based in perception. I say it over and over again. It's a faulty system. And so, yeah, the politicians themselves as individuals are crappy people. And this is really greasy. This is one of the greasiest things I've seen in a long time. Like this is they're just trying to salvage some credibility and some something positive and spin the tide of the media that was descending on Jojo for this disaster. So this was pretty, you know, I mean, this was one of the lower things that I've covered on the political field. But the system is like that. Like they'll do anything, you know, to keep in power and to, I mean, they, they, there's nothing they won't do. Like you can't say, well, I don't think anybody could be that evil. Yeah, they can, right? <laughs> like I've seen it over and over again. But it's not the people, it's the system. I mean, the people are doing, you know, making choices and engaging in this behavior. But it's a system that's ego-driven and a debt-based ec economic system that causes all these things. And it's our collective materialistic um, orientation and our own ego-driven mentality collectively that manifests leaders in a system like this. This is why I say we need to change by connecting to God internally, the heartfulness meditation I talk about all the time, connecting to God internally and manifesting the system based in that. Because otherwise you get this and it's just, you know, getting worse. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramano, definitely reporting from the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.